Hi, my name is Mihai Malaymare. Uh, I'm a cinematographer for Winning Time. My name is Todd Van Hazel. I'm a cinematographer of Winning Time, and this is the Go Creative Show. Hello, and welcome to the Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. My name is Ben Consoli, and today we speak with Todd Van Hazel and Mihai Malaymare Jr., cinematographers of Winning Time on HBO. Guys, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hi, thanks for having us. I am obsessed with the show. I'm not even a basketball fan. I, I, it's just, for some reason, it just drew me in. The story is what kind of drew me in. Cause I'm like, you know, the eighties Celtics Lakers, I'm in Boston. I feel like I kind of have a connection to it, even though I'm not necessarily into basketball per se, <laughs> but, um, just so I was intrigued to begin with. And from the first frame, I was like, oh no, this show is going to be awesome. And it is, you guys delivered. There's so much to talk about. Before we get there, I just want to mention our sponsor today, Filmmakers Academy. Master your craft at Filmmakers Academy. Head over to gocreativeshow.com forward slash Filmmakers Academy and get 10% off with coupon code GOCREATIVE10. And also follow us on your favorite podcast apps, as well as, as well as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. All things Go Creative Show at GoCreativeShow.com. So, first of all, what a great project to be part of. I mean, this the, the, the visuals of this show seem like, to me, that it would be so much fun to work on because you can kind of do anything. It seems like you can really push the boundaries with this show. And for people that aren't familiar with Winning Time, I'd love to just start by kind of explaining the look, because that is what most people are talking about. That's what, at least people in our audience, myself, these are the things we're responding to. Um, who first? I mean, you want to start, Todd? Want to kind of like clue us in into what the look of this show is? How do you describe it? I mean- I guess first, yeah, it really, it is a really fun look to shoot. I mean, I feel like that was my pitch to you, Mihai, when we first talked. It was like, what did you say? I feel like I said, like, you reminded me, I, I think I said, like, hey, do you want to shoot a super long movie together? Was the first pitch. But then was also just like, we run wild. You know, it's jazz on this show. Um, I mean, I guess I would describe the look as like um, a collage of American cultural memory from that time period. You know, we shoot on 35 millimeter and 16 millimeter and eight millimeter and these old Ikigami tube cameras. And it's like a multi-format um, American culture mixtape is the way I've described it. You know, like this aggressive collage of, of images and feelings and memories from that time period, you know? Yeah. I, I actually, I really like that description of it because you're you're taking on a subject matter. I mean, it's the rise of the LA Lakers. It goes all throughout the 80s, although you do shoot, you represent the 70s and even the 60s in the show as well. Um, but because that was such a cultural moment, like everybody that, even if you weren't involved in basketball or interested at all, you still kind of know the LA Lakers rise. Like it was just something so embedded in our culture. And it does feel like memories. That's kind of an interesting take on it. Um, so, Mihai, when you hear Todd tell you this as his pitch to you to get involved, what are you thinking? I, I mean, there was another key element that attracted me to it, and the fact that uh, the, the use of Ikegami, ah. most of all, and and the whole combo. Because, I mean, we all, we all have been in, in a situation where, like, the script says VHSC, and then you have a huge fright. And it's like, why can't we use an Alexa and make it look like a VHSC? Because like, it's it's very hard to do that. So when Todd told me, he's like, yeah, it's a real Ikegami, and uh, we're shooting film, and it's like, okay, that's uh, it has all the right elements. So I was immediately hooked to to the idea and then as soon as i saw the pilot i was like oh yeah that's exactly what i so you didn't I, need I too imagined. much convincing <laughs> no <laughs> talk to me about this ikigami camera i'm not so familiar with it some people in our audience might be talk to me about it and why you ultimately chose this as one of your cameras i mean it's the best camera of all time <laughs> it's, the, it's like a, it, it's a box of pure joy it's I mean, so we started out, the way the Ikigami happened was we were researching what cameras shot 
the actual basketball games and the news conferences back then in the late 70s and because we knew we were going to be reproducing the basketball on TV and also like we were going to be recreating famous news conferences and then bringing them to life, you know, and so we discovered that it was these tube cameras um, and so we procured and started testing a lot of cameras of the period and found that our favorite that had like the most that je ne sais quoi that like that feeling that we remember is these ikigami hc 780 i can't remember the name the number but um i mean they're like that classic they have like the the light streaks when you shoot at something bright and they have that really disgustingly interlaced quality about them and there's just something very special about that look and so from there i think mckay and i started testing how we could use the cameras and we both quickly fell in love with a close-up like we noticed that like that camera on like a low angle super close-up does something so powerful because you're taking like these mythic icons these like mythic characters we all know from culture i mean i'd be curious what it is for you mihai i mean i for me like for me it it's like you're stripping away all the romance and the like there's so much cinematic bravado in the show and like this very like masculine male bravado that's in the script that's in the characters that's in the camera so like something about the the ikigami is like the the uh, opposite of that it's like really unromantic and really emotional and really vulnerable and really unsexy i don't know what is it for you it, it is i mean it feels like it's as close as it gets to a time machine you know and it's like it's so uh, accurate for the for the period that like uh, no matter i mean it's like i remember like on a on a basketball court like for 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 basketball scenes like it was unbelievable everybody who was like kind of walking by a monitor if the ikegami was on they were like oh my god it's like it like it looks like i'm i'm there back in 79 um but uh, it's like it's not only that it's like it's, it's a certain quality that like triggers something in our brain it's like oh yeah I'm, I, I, you can deny it. You know, it's like you're back in the 80s. You, this show comes out at kind of an interesting time. I mean, when Instagram first started really becoming popular, those kind of like Instagram filters became all the rage. You're starting to, de you're starting to degrade <laughs> the look of the pristine camera, um, the phone cameras. And then it just kept going further and further. People started buying, you know, uh, th those Instamatic cameras to take like little you know, pol Polaroids and things. My my little niece, she's 10 years old. She loves that thing. And I think there is like a general like yearning for something that feels tangible and something that feels authentic and it isn't so pristine. And I think you guys coming out now and at this point in our in our world and in our culture, um, is it's sort of an interesting time. And I think that's probably in part to why people are responding so well to it. It has a feel. There's something that you can, you almost feel like you can grab it in a weird way. It's, it's strange. There's the, the having film and video that is like filled with mistakes and filled with all the things that you would normally clean up and get rid of, just letting it be there. There's an authenticity to it that no other show is really embracing as much as you are. Was there something, I mean, was that part of your thinking, Todd, when kind of developing this look? I mean, I think we wanted it to have a handmade feeling. And I think that is, that's what it is for me. And even like this idea that the Ikigami, like the video, cause I feel like video now has a different connotation, but like the idea of video back then is as equally like an exciting format. I mean, they were recording to like magnetic tape, I would assume at the time, you know, it's like a very like tactile, tangible thing. And like those tube cameras is like, it's like gas inside them. It's crazy. You know, like they too are like a live image gathering device, even though it's electronic, you know? So yeah, I don't know. It's the handmade quality about it. That's exciting to me. I think it's also about the time period. Like it was a time period. It's interesting making the show during the pandemic because like we're making a show about a time when people were like really liberal about their, like their interactions, you know what I mean? In terms of like, like sex and drugs and like all these things, like, so I don't know. It's just like a more visceral looser time period and it felt good to have that in the image as well mihai can you talk to me about the other cameras that you were filming with because when you watch the show it's it becomes clear right away in the pilot episode you're going to be uh, mixing a lot of formats throughout this series talk to me about that what were some of the other cameras you were mixing in i mean our main our main package was was 35 but um 
just like from from the pilot, that was another element that like attracted me to the to the whole project is is the Super Eight camera, and uh, the fact that I mean, if you look at the Super Eight images, is, is is one thing, and you'll be able to tell the difference from a Super Eight to a thirty five. But scanning the perf, that was the like which Todd you did in, for the pilot as well. That, that was brilliant because right away it's like you know it's it's a format that like was used for 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 home. Uh, movies and and it's like it puts you there like it has another it's like another time machine quality you know it's like your your brain right away triggers it's like oh yeah it's it's somebody there in the family using a super 8 camera or an so you camera. had the super 8 you had 35 you had the ikigami <laughs> the 35 super 8 ikigami and then we we, we added 16 i mean we were talking about 65 at one point right? like, but i feel like neither um, of us could figure out we, could, we couldn't motivate uh, like, well, yeah. how to be yeah, like, like, like is it when they when they start the team, like what is the <laughs> we i mean especially it's like when you start mixing formats i think it's like you open a door to to everything you know it's like we we definitely had certain rules for like it wasn't like oh it's just like let's use all of all of them like for for, for certain scenes we, we we started with ikigami and then the eight mil was doing uh, little pickups and, and and things but uh we we're trying i mean 16 mil came very handy for for like as soon as we started shooting basketball because we needed a smaller handheld camera roller blade camera and and, and all that but um it's um it, we we actually used it quite a lot for for some other things, but like mainly we were 35, 8 mil and Ikegami. That was the, the, the yeah. main combo. Now, there must have been some work in the processing of that film to give it an even more grainy and uh, a grainy look because, I mean, the reality is it, it looks really old and no matter how much, you know, whether it's 8 millimeter, 16 millimeter, it's still going to be a little bit cleaner than you guys are presenting on the show. So, Talk to me about some of the processing that was done, what your strategy was to get it to give it that you know winning time look. I mean, it's funny. Modern film stocks are so clean and they're beautiful. I mean, they're so gorgeous. But like, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, I feel like even 10 years ago, I remember like there were multiple, there was Fuji and there were all these different kinds of film stocks, and there was like you had more choices for the aesthetic and the look. And now yeah. I find that like, vision three, the series are so Kodak film is so beautiful, but like they have a very uniform look to them. So like it becomes about how do you break them down to get them to look like how we remember film stocks looking back then. But also for us, it was about, I think for me at least is about realizing that what we're, the look we're going for is not actually even an older film stock. It's an older film print. And it's an older film print that has been left in a box and ignored and we've now rescanned it and like, it's not, it's kind of falling apart, you know? So like for us to do that, I mean, the basics are we pushed processed everything. We underexposed everything more so in the pilot, less so on the show, but we underexposed to a certain degree. Um, we, uh, and then there's a bunch of, uh, digital processes as well that soften certain, uh, certain colors in the film, uh, so that faces are protected, but the rest of the image sort of approximates more of like a 16 millimeter resolution than a 35 millimeter resolution. We added more um, gate weave that would be closer to like in between eight and 16 millimeter in terms of the gates movement as opposed to 35. It's another thing is the new cameras, the gates are so solid that like they don't move as much as the older ones. Or even like imagine if you're watching a film print on like a bad projector in a theater, there may be more movement in it, you know? Yeah. Um, digital grain added on top of the organic grain, um, extra highlight halation added digitally that would represent more the way a 16 millimeter negative, uh, the highlights would bounce through the emulsion and back, back through the film. Um, so like things like that kind of like, I don't know, I always thought of it as like a hybrid of like a photochemical and digital look, you know, and then there's the LUT, the looks, the LUTs that were created by our colorist, Walter Valpato that are essentially like riffs on ectochrome or Kodachrome film stocks. Uh, but in my opinion, like contrastier even, you know, I mean, we tested real ectochrome and it's beautiful, but it also like felt too modern and we needed something that was more contrasty and more stripped down and dirtier, you know, in the blacks and things like that. Is there anything, I feel like I'm leaving stuff out, Mihai. I mean, we didn't dust bust the negative, you know, we left all the, 
the dirt yeah. and dust that stays on the negative at the lab, they normally blow it off, but we ask them to keep it all in as like a base, you know, is there anything else I'm trying to think? Yeah, I mean, if you think about like the dust in the gate, that uh, like I'm looking at the eight mil footage, and as soon as there's a bit of dust there, it's so organic and <laughs> great. Um, and digitally, we cleaned only the dust that was like really offensive or was like really well, like on top face. of uh, somebody's face. But that was it. was there uh, in winning time being able to shoot with all these different formats. Does that create? kind of a freedom for you as a filmmaker or did it almost bring up more problems than it was <laughs> worth in a way? Like well, it's one thing to talk about it and then to actually do it, there must've been some surprises along the way. And I'm curious, like uh, were, was there ever these moments where you were like, oh my God, why did we do this? <laughs> like, maybe this isn't the right thing. Did you doubt yourself at all? <laughs> I mean, I we had a rule book that felt really good. You know, the pilot, I think, was a bit of like, t we'd shoot the pilot, like we'd shoot certain scenes on like all three formats at the same time. And even in the show we would, but we they'd have different uses. But sometimes in the pilot, there are photos of like a wide shot on an eight millimeter, an Ikigami, and a 35 millimeter, because we were still figuring out what was the language and what was going to feel right, you know? But once we had the rule book, I feel like it was done fun riffing on it and trying things and like looking at a scene. And I know like, Mihai, you and Justin, our, our our vintage format operator, would be like looking at a scene and be like, oh, maybe we can get that Ekigami, you know, as a weird extra little off eyeline close up, you know. I it was more like sometimes I would look at it and be like and laugh and just say, like, man, we really created like a massive thing for ourselves. Like our paintbrushes, you know, it's like it, it was never overwhelming, but it definitely was like, whose idea was it to bring, to bring the entire palette <laughs> of paintbrushes to every single scene, you know? <laughs> I love that. Mihai, did you feel the same way? Did it did it almost at times feel overwhelming? Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes at, at night or, or night scenes, you would have to be careful with the Ikegami. But like even then, like the grainier and then and, and, uh, it's like it, sometimes it was amazing. You know, it's like um, and and like sh shooting film, I don't know if it's, it's, it's just uh, enjoying itself, but it, it felt um it felt way more forgiving and more like usually like we 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 struggle so much with like fluorescent lights like when you when you use a digital camera and you have to deal with fluorescent lights in a location it's like it's a struggle and like okay we should replace them correct the green and and all that with film you point it at something and it's it's beautiful right away yeah i mean i also feel like the limitations are what was so exciting about it like the eight mm the the Ikigami yeah. exposure yeah. limitations or the eight millimeter exposure limitations, like having Justin shoot black and white real Tri-X eight millimeter film that's very slow and he's shooting slow motion on it. So he's like shooting 70 something frames a second on the eight millimeter <laughs> and it's true black and white. And when you get the image back, you're like, wow, I never would have been gutsy enough to expose or light like that where like so much of the image goes black, but the thing that does is still there is so powerful and grainy and beautiful in the human face. It's like, those limitations make it feel alive, you know? So like putting yourself in a situation for those happy accidents to happen, I feel like was really freeing, I felt. Did you get any pushback from producers, from, you know, HBO, from anybody? Because this is such a different look and it, I mean, it's an important show. I mean, you, you know, it's not like you guys are doing a student film here. Did you get any pushback where people were like, I don't know, I don't know if this is gonna, if this is the right approach? I mean, the people, HBO, people are pretty supportive from the beginning. I mean, I think uh, McKay and I did a lot of testing. Like, we did not go into this kind of like cowboys, like, hey, we want to do this crazy thing and, you know, no one can tell us anything about it. Like, we tested the living hell out of it. And we also originally thought we were going to shoot 16. And we did like a full round of tests on 16 and oh, really wow. had settled on the look. And ultimately, it was decided that like, 16 wasn't the right starting place because with a with a show where we have to modulate the look where it needs to like be more bold and beautiful and also more stripped down if 16 was as beautiful as we could get then we had like less room to modulate so we started thinking about ways to make 35 look like a weird hybrid version of, like our version of 16 you know but um no there wasn't a lot of pushback but i also think we communicated it from the beginning that like 
this was the idea and we looked at tests together. If anything, there were more just conversations about technically, like what's going to happen when we stream this look and what, you know, like how much of the show legally can, which blew my mind that this was actually a concern, but like how much of the show can legally be shot on 16 and eight millimeter and 480 I on the, on the Ikigami. Like, you what know, what do you mean? What, well, you, what, what's the legal aspect? Because, like, I feel like now a lot of distributors, the, you, you have to be delivering shows in either 4k or an HBO. Uh, I case see, I see, I see. UK. So the question is like a lot of what we were shooting wasn't natively 2k. Even if we were scanning it, <clears throat> in 2k or 4k the acquisition format was in some cases like in the ikigami's case i forget but like 400 lines of resolution i mean it's nothing you know so the question was like legally they'd never really they'd done little flashes of it but no one had ever looked into is it okay for full scenes or for like a certain percentage of a show to be delivered like this so there were those conversations but once that got figured out you know i think it's also just like talking to post about a lot of the things that you normally QC and that you normally mark as a mistake, we are doing intentionally. So it was about having these long meetings where we really did talk through each element and say, like, the image is going to be shaky all the time. Like, not high intel shaky, but, like, gate weave shaky. It will, like, the, the image itself will have vibration and there will be hairs on the image and it will be out of focus and, you know, th things like that um, help people understand that, that is intentional and that it shouldn't send in everyone into like an autopilot panic every time it happens. But I think once the pilot was shot, people understood at first. I think people were like, what, you know, there was these jokes about like how many formats are we using and, and, and why and things like that. But I think once people saw what we were trying to do, then people hopefully got excited about it, you know? And, but to, a short answer to your question is HBO was really supportive and really excited about doing it. And, um, yeah, yeah. You said the word aggressive earlier in the show when describing the look. And I think that's a really good word for it because it does hit you hard. And it's like you you lay out so much in the pilot where it's like, if you're not down with this, then like stop watching because this, this is what you're going to get. And it's even going to get crazier <laughs> as you go. Um I'd like to I'd like to hear from you, Mihai, about your interpretation of aggressive cinematography. What does that mean to you? I don't know. I mean, it's it's one of those things that like uh, I'm excited to do um, anything new, anything that I've never done before, for sure. But it's it's one of those things that like I don't know. I mean, it might feel aggressive, but I think it's like I think it works so well for for the story. And it's unique and it's different and it's like, you know, it's uh, it, it's one one of those like I, I that's why I got so so excited to to be part of it because uh, not only that it's it was different from everything I've done but it's different from everything. I think it also supports there. the characters. I mean, don't don't you feel like it it supports kind yeah, of yeah. the story and the, the story vibe and of the show yeah. is kind of aggressive. I mean, it really is like that. That's kind of the story that you're telling and and I love that. Um, the last episode I saw, it made me laugh. Uh, the, the, it was the, the most recent one as of, you know, March 28th, uh, March 29th. Um, you guys, in the script, they make a reference to the practice footage being green. And I, I, I was like, that was like, this show is like made for cinematographers. It really is. Because when you just, I think filmmakers will really enjoy the little things the little things that you say and do in your camera work and in your in cinematography that just acknowledges the same way that the characters acknowledge that the camera's there breaking the fourth wall. I think you guys kind of, you sort of do that with the cinematography as well. And it was just a, a fun little side note that, that I liked in the last episode. No real question <laughs> associated with it. I just thought it was hilarious. I want to talk to you guys about something that's on Filmmakers Academy that makes it extremely unique. And it's this idea of curating courses into something called career paths. And I wanted to bring Shane Herbert back on to talk to us about exactly what these career paths are and how uh, how you guys can benefit from them. So Shane, tell us about it. No, it's awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. Yeah, so career paths, so many people would say, Shane, I, I've come to your site and, uh, you know, I love what's going on here, but where do I start? So I thought, oh my God, let's, let's start to create curriculums 
for like cinematography, what it's going to be like when you start out, beginning cinematography, light meters, color meters, uh, understanding leadership, resiliency, and then you start to learn key light, backlight, fill light, position, ratios, all those kind of things. And then the advance goes down the rabbit holes. They're so cool. And some of them are loaded with 200 plus hours of instruction. You've got career paths in a variety of subjects, cinematography, directing, camera assistant, lighting technicians, and all of that. It's available right now at filmmakersacademy.com. So check it out for yourself, guys. I know you're going to love these things. Filmmakersacademy.com. Let's transition to talking about the lighting for winning time. Um, you know, we talked a lot about the camera choices um, to, to represent the time period of the late 70s and early 80s. We also talked about the post-processing, that sort of push processing you talked about, the ectochromes look that you were trying to achieve and successfully did. Um, but now, what are the lighting choices that you're making in order to also tell the story of this time period? I would describe the lighting as, uh, the lighting approach as, uh, as built in and period accurate as possible, uh, which means we built as many ceilings into the sets as possible and built the lighting into the ceilings. So we could not only see the ceilings, but that they would light the scene realistically. Um, what does that do that for all, you? Having, having real ceilings for this. I mean, it does two things for me. One for this show, we spent a lot of time shooting low angle one because they're very tall characters, but two also, I think that's the look of the show is this sort of like larger than life quality, but, more importantly, what it does is it allows you, the room is lit and feels real and light bounces around the room in a real way. And, you know, when we're like the offices, for example, the ceilings are all built in and, and then in the ceiling are real fluorescent housings. And on the pilot, we had actual fluorescent tubes. And on the show, we replaced it with uh, LED RGB pixel tape, but to replicate the same feeling of uncorrected two green fluorescent bulbs. What happens is <clears throat> all the reflections of that ceiling go into people's skin and skin tone and, and the reflections of the set and everything just has like a quality of like a raw realness to it. Also, actors can move around the set. Um, we, I feel like we light, light in a very similar way, Mihai, where like there's very few lights on the ground and if they are, they're outside windows. Like you try to keep the set as clean as possible so that you can shoot in a more free way with the actors and just think it leads to like a, a feeling of realism and, and allows you to improvise, you know? But then so on top of that is hard light. It's like a it's like a period lit built in look with then like 70s hard light bravado on top of it. You know, big backlights, hard key lights and bringing out all the, like, the skin shine and that those hard shadows, you know. So yeah, it's like it can feel like a restriction, but like it's 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 one of those that it works so well. And it's like I, I do love wide angle and wide lenses, low angle. Uh, so it's. Like it's an amazing thing to to have a, a set built like a real location, you know, and with the lights built into the set, that's like that's perfect. You know, there's something that happens. Like I feel like when you don't have ceilings, you start getting greedy, and you start like, oh, an actor walked into a corner. Cool, let's just throw up a quick soft light over his head to to protect it, you know. <laughs> but if you have ceilings, yeah, yeah. you're like you you put yourself in a situation like on location. And you've planned for it. You know, when you build your ceilings, you also put the lights in a place where you know, okay, we'll be covered. Like there's a table in this corner or that, that side of the room is near a window. So we don't need light above, you know, whatever it is. But it's like, it puts you in situations where the lighting does things that you hope, I would hope that I would have the courage to do, you know, where like you let it get too dark, you let it get too bright, you know, things like that. But you're like building those scenarios into the set, you know? Yeah, and what's that yeah. part of your kind of look book, the sort of like your show Bible when you're thinking to yourself about, all right, we're going to, we're going to put ceilings in whenever we can. We're going to light from the ceiling as much as we can not have lights on the floor when we can, and just kind of it, 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 accept where it goes from there. Like, was it, was that part of the strategy? Yeah, that was in the look book. That was in the design of it. And because it's not only like a workflow, but it also yields an aesthetic. You know, it means that like our references were like Cassavetti's movies and early Altman movies, you know, California Split and a lot of photography, not cinematography. So it's like all these and a lot of documentary photography. It's like all these images where 
it does feel like you just showed up to a location and threw up some hard lights really quick and shot, you know? So, um, yeah, that was part of the design. Yeah. I was reading in the prep for this episode that some of your inspiration came from not only period movies and television, but period advertising. Uh, and I'm interested to hear about that. What, what was it about the advertising of that time, seventies and eighties that, that helped influence the look of the show? I mean, this was also one of the really fun things I felt prepping with you, Mihai, was like exchanging like the grossest American advertising <laughs> yeah. images we could find from the period. I mean, for me, it comes from the fact that like a main theme of the show is this idea of like this bought and sold happy white America. And like, that's Larry Bird, that's the Celtics, that's like what basketball is at the time. And then like the shifting of culture into black culture, you know, in black culture into pop culture and like the power of that and the power of what magic means for a culture and the pushback that like was happening between like white America and, and, you know, like, so I think like that is felt in the advertising. Like you look at the images back then and it's like these happy white families and like all this kind of stuff, you know? And so we were looking for the way America looked to Americans on television and in magazines and then taking that and stripping that look back, you know? So I think like we each used it more for like each episode uh, focuses on a certain character's flashback and their life. So we looked at like the dominant advertising of the period of whatever that flashback was and sort of riffed on that. I mean, episode two has Jerry West's flashback, right? His like childhood and, um, in the early sixties. Uh, so we found like, you know, early, um, Kodachrome, uh, advertising images from the sixties, these like really poppy candy looking uh, images of, uh, American families. But so we shot with a look like that, but what's going on in the images is like an alcoholic father who sent their child off to war and who died in the war. And now they're making their younger child feel guilty for that. I mean, this like broken American family, you know, so, um, yeah, I think just like playing with those tropes. I don't know. I'm trying to think Mihai of one of the, the ones that you got. Yeah. What, what were some of the, what were some of the ads that resonated with you, Mihai, that just felt, a, you know, as a good, as something to kind of look at as inspiration? I'm trying to remember, but like one, one thing that stuck uh, to, with me was the, the use of hard light. And, you know, it's like now we're so in, in like everywhere, you know, if you think about it and it's like. Because that was the, the the tool of 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 the era. I mean, like we're we're so used to soft light and and like I don't even remember when the Kino flops came came out, but like way way later. So it's like it was this idea which you find in still photography quite a lot. It's like you can work with one light, and you'd better choose carefully where to place it. And there are, there are of course tools to soften it a little bit, but most of the times you didn't have those, so you'd better choose it carefully and, and and see where you place it. And you see that pretty much everywhere. It's like the use of hard light compared to today's imagery where everything is soft, everything is, you know. Um, and we discovered that with, with everything, it's like we, we, we had such a joy of like not filtering and not using like soft filters on, on our lights and just like sometimes use I, I remember with 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 Josh, our our gaffer, like uh, having a, a an Arimax with no no diffusion as a front light, and we're both looking at it like it's pretty great. Should we? Yeah, let's keep it like this. Let's let's go for it. <laughs> you know? There is something about that hard light that makes everything to me when I watch it. It's probably gonna sound stupid, but whenever I watch anything with really hard light, it makes me feel like everything's hot or like wet. It's we. It's like it brings out a shine in skin that even no no makeup is going to de shine what a hard light's going to do on someone's face. Um, and I read in some of the prep for this episode is that you you even use some of those words like greasy and uh, I, I think you even I think you even said like shiny or greasy or something when you were describing the look of the show. Um, can, can you talk to me a little bit more about what the hard light does, even though it's period and yeah, you're, you're trying to replicate a certain period, but is there something revealing about it? Is there something, you know, that, that really fits the character development in the hard lighting, Todd? Yeah, I think it both, it's interesting because it both, uh, I think it both makes someone stand out like a movie star, like it both hyper designs them in a way and also 
brings out all these things that we now hide in modern cinematography. It brings out texture and shine and color. And we worked a lot with our makeup department to test different levels and styles of makeup to find that line where like the hard light made people glow and have this shine in a way that they used to on film, but not also make them feel gross. You know, it's like that line where it's sensual and human, but not ugly, you know, or it's ugly, beautiful, whatever that is, you know, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I think also modern digital cameras are so sensitive that we end up using less light and we end up using, like we're taking away light and we're relying on ambience and like, I find that like, it's, it's just what's in vogue right now is like, uh, underexposed and darker and lower contrast. And, th- and all those things that happen with that is like, you have less color saturation and less shine and less texture and film stocks were just slower a long time ago. And so you needed more light to like even get the image to, to hold. So, um, that's just what this show wanted was like saturation and pop and contrast and shine and all that comes from, like like you were saying, Mihai, like frontal hard light. I mean, I remember thinking that, like, oh, on this show, fill light is, like, punk rock. Like, I used to think of, like, fill light as, like, <laughs> the word, you know, I remember in, like, schools, like, fill lights, like, you'd be embarrassed if you had to turn it on, you know? And it's like, now, nah, fill light is cool. Like, fill light is where this glow comes and the shine comes out in wardrobe and in faces and skin and color pop. I mean, it's really cool. So what was your strategy for the lighting then? Using those hard lights, you said frontal hard lights. Are you, are you, you know, doing some sort of a bounce fill with the single hard light or like, how, how are you? And I don't know, this situation changes all the time. So let's, let's pick something. Let's say dialogue scene, interior, daytime. How are you incorporating a hard, you know, frontal light? I mean, I would say that like, basically if the scene is lit by the the built-in lights, whatever that is, whether that's fluorescence from above or window light from outside, that's your base. And then on top of that, we're putting a hard light near camera frontal with no diffusion on, wow. you know, like an old style movie. I mean, we're either using like the R15, which is this beautiful, hard ellipsoidal, um, ellipsoidal uh, LED light or a Q5. Some, I don't know, Mihai, you guys were using like tungsten lights. Once in a while, we would use like an actual tungsten Fresnel, but usually we were using LEDs to replicate it. But yeah, a full-on Fresnel style hard light with no diffusion. Wow, that is that is revealing for sure to the characters. I mean, how did like, how did the talent feel about that? It must be so unusual for them to have just a hard light blasting right into their face. Mihai, did, did you did you find that talent was sort of feeling this was unusual to them? Did they embrace it? I think I think they they embraced just the idea of, of having a, a film camera. You know, it's like and then then everything changes. Like oh, it's like oh, we're actually shooting film and we're shooting like two or three cameras. It's it, I think just the presence of a film camera changes everything. Changes the dynamic. Really, of, of you're nodding, Todd. Camera. You feel the same way, people. Yeah, I do. I feel like people had a sense that we were doing something different the wrong word, but I actually feel like with a lot of these actors, I feel like they have come from a time when hard light or, key, you know, when lighting was more like that. So actually maybe they were more comfortable in it. You know, I feel like think about like Sally Field and like, these are like legends that are used to having like special lights in the room, you know, like, so in some ways I feel like it's more disrespectful for an actor to be in a room where there are no lights in the room and no feeling of like, Oh, there's like, you know, I, actors know like, Oh my, they want us to look this way. You know, my eyelines to the right, because there's that big light over there, you know, mm-hmm. like they, I feel like they are dancing and interacting with the lights in a way. So for me, I feel like seeing that key light near the camera communicates that like the cinematographer is taking care of them and is, and is thinking about their eyeline, their close up. you know, their, story, you know. Interesting thought, because I feel like we've, I mean, we've talked to so many cinematographers on this show, and it's come up a bunch of times, this idea of allowing the talent to move freely in the space or, you know, just be able to act without the, without the worry of where the camera is necessarily, where the lights are necessarily. And I like this idea, Todd, that you're presenting to us about those things that, you know, providing those things that 
uh, talent may actually be using to help their performance and get a better sense of the space. That's that's kind of an interesting conversation. Mihai, any thoughts on that? Did you feel the same way that the actors sort of responded well to maybe these older style ways of filmmaking that they don't commonly see nowadays? No, I, I think so. And I, I mean, it's it's like that doesn't mean that every single shot had a had a big uh, uh, frontal uh, hard. Sure. Uh, key light you know it's like it, it happened but like it's it, it, it goes back to 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 that idea that it's like yeah it's like not only it's a bigger camera that it needs uh time to reload every 10 11 minutes it's like it's a, the whole process it's it's kind of going back to to the basics which i think everybody enjoys absolutely yeah i think there's like a trust too i feel like because we were shooting on film yeah, and because yeah. we had the eight millimeter that had no video tap on it. And you see, so you've got Justin just like in the corner in between takes talking to sound being like, Hey, I'm going to roll right until they start talking. So, you know, the beginning of the scene would be like, and then all of a sudden, right before an actor talks, it stops, you know, like there was, I think the actors I would assume had to have a feeling of like, all right, these guys are like, there's a whole bunch of shit going on behind camera. And they're like, there's a mad scientist thing happening. And we have to trust it, you know, but like you're saying, Mihai, like trust it the way we had to used to trust it when it was only on film. And like, you had to really look at the operator and be like, did you get it? Or like to the AC, did you get it? You know? So I think it's more about trust. And in some ways, like when digital, when there is a giant monitor and everyone's seeing it in a weird way, there's less trust because people can see it and they're like, oh, it's finished. I, you know, it's like, there's no, there's none of that mystery anymore, you know? Yeah, I love that. No, Todd, you give us a little bit of a breakdown of just uh, just just a blanket approach to your daytime interiors on winning time. And obviously things are case by case, yes. But I'd like to do the same with you, Mihai, on evening. Like, how are you handling evening shots, you know, night exteriors, you're working with film, um, in some cases, eight millimeter, 16 millimeter, this sort of hard light look that we've been talking about. What is your approach to night exteriors? We'll we'll talk about that. One one thing that we we tested a lot and we we discussed from the beginning was the 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 use of uh, mercury vapor and sodium vapor uh, fixtures. You know, and it's like it's amazing how how much of the of the new tools of the the LED lights are, are so helpful in that because like you I don't remember like there are a few locations where we had like period accurate mercury or sodium uh, street lights most of them are LED now so LED now so you have to kind of either replicate that or we did have a few um fixtures like real uh, mercury and real sodium but like it i remember uh, with todd we did a lot of tests for for just like choosing the flavors of of mercury vapor or or sodium or um and just trying to see um i think we had like three or four versions for each where we were trying to to replicate and like one more more aggressive one one more and and there are amazing tools now it's like if you think of of, of the film uh, sensitivity now, it's like you're 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 automatically think well, you'll need a lot more light. But uh, but thinking about the 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 movers that that we're using and the fact that you can change the color and pinpoint those everywhere you you want, it's like it didn't feel as as crazy as I I thought it would be. You know, because it's it's a pretty big jump if you think about it. It's like we we're, we're used to use digital cam- camera that we're rated at 1600 ISO and then like we go back to, to 500 now um, it didn't feel as 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 as, as crazy as I, I, I thought it would be you know but I think it's again it's going back to to those like what were the real fixtures and and um, we're kind of even when we're uh, scouting we're kind of like hunting those like either neon or fluorescent or or crazy interesting color light sources that are not there so you were looking in your scouts you were looking for places that just had these lights still they still remained versus just going in and changing them yourselves yeah yeah i mean most of them there was there was our ideal scenario and then like of course we were using quite a few locations where we had led street lighting and we had to to kind of either cover those or 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 at our, our, our fake street lights and, and so on. But we're hunting green, for example, like any green or, or 
Mercury Blue was or I want to talk about some specific scenes in Winning Time and we'll begin a little bit more general in just your game footage. I mean, just filming filming gameplay. I mean, these are actors. They're not basketball players. So there there must have been some challenge with swapping in extras and and getting body doubles and finding the shots of, you know, moments that look like real basketball playing. Um, I'm curious, and maybe I'm wrong. Uh, what, what was your strategy to film these game sequences and make them look as authentic and real as possible? And Todd, we'll start with you. Uh, it was a wild dance. I mean, I think it starts with the, the actors were trained as much as possible to play not only like high level basketball, but play like the characters they're playing. You know, Quincy was trained for the entire time to play and move like magic, the no look pass, the high hand dribbling, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then we had extraordinary, uh, basketball doubles, um, who would also would switch out, who were also dealing with um, heights of actors uh, and various ways of cheating those heights on and off the court. I mean, I think the basic workflow, tell me if you agree with this, Mihai, is like we'd start wide, we'd shoot the basketball scenes from our widest positions, often on the Ikigami cameras, on the television cameras, and on film from wide, but like uh, shooting the plays as if they were live, happening completely with a mix of the actors and our basketball doubles. And then we'd get in closer and closer and closer and start breaking it down piece by piece using various camera tools um, on the faces of our actors and as much as possible with our actors doing what as great basketball as they could. And then we'd fill in the blanks with the basketball, uh, with the doubles. I mean, the main, I think, weapon that really helped it come alive was our rollerblade operator. It was John Lake was, um, our rollerblade operator who took a small 16 millimeter camera and kind of became one of the players. I mean, we were basically rehearsing the plays and then we were bringing in John to rehearse like one of the players. And we would figure out ways of him doing these like long extended oneers moving through a play, following a pass to another player up to a face into the net. You know, it's like, we were trying to figure out a way to get the camera physically to keep up with the game and also have like emotional, connection with the characters and the rollerblade camera was like the, the the real weapon for that but honestly sometimes the ikigami tv cameras were the ultimate weapon i mean they just made it feel real like you looked at everyone in period outfits playing these famous plays from a wide from like the right position where the cameras actually were on tv on the ikigami and you're like i believe this so i think it's like a combination of all these things all these techniques together you believe it you know we, we were also lucky that we, we, we learned by doing without jumping straight into a, uh, into a real basketball scene. Because, uh, Todd, I think you had the, the Lansing uh, basketball uh, court outside and we had the training camp. And it was like, okay, like if we screw up really bad, now it's like, now it's the time to learn. And like, we kind of brought everything. I remember we brought John for, for both of our pre real basketball <laughs> scenes and we realized like okay these are the tools that really work and, and these are the, the things we should try and maybe we can experiment more in, in that area and so on. But it was it was definitely like the in, in, in the real uh, basketball scenes we're like starting with the angles that we knew from from real it broadcast. Seemed yeah. like it would I be so right behind, like I, I was just saying, it seemed just, I'm thinking just how overwhelming the challenge would be to keep track of all the shots and know, like, you know, th you're, the fact that you have to swap in doubles and, I mean, you're basically doing, like, action sequences the whole time. It's, it's, it's crazy. It, it's like choreography and action sequences all at the same time with multiple vintage cameras, or not vintage cameras, but multiple formats. It's like, it's crazy. Yeah. But you, you start, say, it, it is. Well, no, I agree with you. It, it, and it's like what you're saying, Mihai, it's like we actually, we got good at it because we had a chance to get better at it as we went. It's actually like the story of the script is like the Lakers are, first they don't know how to gel, then they start gelling, then they start doing better, then they start doing really better. And then by the season finale, they're playing this very legendary level of basketball, you know, and I think we got to film it that way as well. So like, as they got better, we got better at it. And I think at a certain point you just know, like instinctually, like the Ikigami gives us these things. And then as you're storyboarding at that point, you know, like 
the basketball doubles gives us these and wides allow us these elements, but the, you know, the scene never really works until you get a camera right here physically with the character, you know, and it's like you start understanding what pieces you can and can't get. You also spend a lot of time shooting stuff that doesn't work and you, and you just realize like, okay, got it. Like that was a waste of two hours. And, you know, we now know like, cool, where you can't shoot basketball that way, you know, and I think also the eight millimeter was like a major, major key in this, which is Justin Cameron, our operator, running around free on set without a monitor with his eight millimeter camera, climbing up into the rafters of the set, shooting down and making sure to get the dunks and and get in there and get the hits and like him like telling the story, knowing the beats in the script and just I mean, the editors and our showrunner told me every single time they were shooting, they were editing basketball and they were missing a specific beat. The answer was in the bin labeled a millimeter, all those details, you know? Oh, that's awesome. What a fun gig that that's this Justin must've had. My God, <laughs> going around on rollerblades, grabbing everything. That's so cool. Did you guys build a court for the show? Were you yeah. on studio? Yeah, we built a 360 court, uh, on stage, which was, uh, had a real court and had a certain amount of, um, stands and had two tunnel entrances and a tunnel that you could walk through all the way and come out onto the court. And then the rest was green screen. So in that way you could, it could be switched out for multiple courts and multiple time periods, you know? What about the lighting in the court? Did you use any vintage fixtures or are you just led panels or how did you handle it? Uh, Mihai, do you want to talk about our favorite light of all time? It's like the, the R15. It's, it's amazing. Like I'm, really? Why'd you love it so much? I mean, the versatility, because that, that was one, one thing we, we spoke about is like, how do you make, which is like, essentially it's the same lighting, but there are like different bulbs. Like we were looking at that photos from like, well, like different arenas, like some are like leaning blue somewhere. Like it's the same, like as, as you have the same like array with lights and, some arenas will have mercury vapor, some will have sodium. And it's like, how do you use a light that will allow you to change that on a spot? And, and just the R15, the versatility of it, it's, it's unbelievable. So, yeah, it also to me, it looks like a metal halogen stadium light. It's crazy. Like, you know, I think typically these sets like this are lit with uh, soft light, with, um, with space lights or whatever it's going to be. And we knew we needed it to be hard light. There's all these problems associated with that. You know, it's like when you point light straight down, they can burn out the housings and it, you know, it's like, how do you get the exposure and the control, but also have all these hard light shadows, you know, and also like, it, how do you reflect? I was worried that in the court itself, you would see the reflection of all the stage lights and the space lights. So the fact that we had these R15s up there that are basically, they look like metal halide lights in the reflection, in people's skin, in the floor, in the shadows. So it was like the key to, yeah, I agree. It, it felt like we were, it was stadium lighting that we could control, you know? I'm looking at them right now. I believe that Cineo Re Reflex R15s, right? Yeah, I'll put a link to it in the show notes, guys, so you can check it out for yourself. So we only have a few minutes left and I do want to just uh, pick out a couple of specific scenes, just get a little bit of some insight onto it. Todd, we'll start with you. Let's talk about this white party where um, we kind of, I think that's the first time we see Magic play, even though it wasn't successful for him in that moment. But um, talk to me about that. We always ask our guests to pinpoint a couple of scenes that really uh, they want to talk about that resonate with them, that may have a story associated with it. You had selected that scene. I, I, it's a great scene. I'd love to know what was it about it that really resonated with you and what's the story behind it? I selected the white party scene because that it to me uh, encompasses the larger theme of the show, which is like this story of magic leaving Lansing and entering into this like different world, this world of like Los Angeles and fame and money and power and like this this uh, white spaces entering into currently white spaces. Uh, so the white party is like a perfect. Uh, analogy for that right because he's literally showing up and they put him in like a white coat and he steps into this party where he's being observed uh and looked at uh in a, in a certain way um so i mean i think that's the camera follows that and the lighting follows that um and the production design follows that and ultimately he ends up playing a game of basketball with norm uh 
being watched by a party of rich white people. And it's like, what is that feeling uh, to not only feel like you're out of your league? Like he's, he's entering into the NBA, which is intimidating. And it's like the end of his childhood. He's also entering into this like very, um, this white space or this like public space where he's going to be observed and judged. So it's like, what is that feeling for him? How did you support that theme with the lighting? Because, you know, watching it, it, it almost felt like you were, Clearly, we were at somebody's house. We were at a, a basketball court that wasn't, you know, a regular basketball court. It wasn't in an arena or anything. But there were things about the lighting that made it feel like, you know, he was under the microscope. He was still kind of being lit in a similar way to what it may feel like on a real NBA court. Um, can you talk to us about the lighting for that scene? Yeah, I mean, the lighting is motivated by... Uh, the owner of the house has a very expensive, very fancy basketball court in the backyard. Uh, and they have turned on all the, you know, period halogen lights that light the court. So what ends up happening by accident, but intentionally is that the two basketball players are lit like an arena, like a show, uh, for them to play while all the guests who are around the party are more in like the shadows watching it. And I mean, so that's like the lighting look that's also in the edit, you know, it's like while they're playing, it's Hank is cutting really quickly with these flashes of laughing white faces watching them, you know? So yeah, I think it's, that's, that's the feeling. Yeah. And I think there's such an expectation when you don't know anything about the show, you're just starting to watch it. I think that's in the first episode, that scene, um, you expect more basketball in a way than you get when you first watch it, which was great for me because it's, I'm not that huge of a basketball fan. It's just the the drama, the personalities, the characters, they really are the leading factor in this series. And I think that when you do get basketball gameplay, especially something like this in the first episode where it's not professional, quote unquote, you're just at someone's house. It really leans into the idea that this is a show about characters more than anything else. And I, I really loved what that scene did for the overall story. Um, Mihai, the scene that you had wanted to talk about is The Lodge, which is actually the last episode that I just saw. So <laughs> I would love for you to talk to me about this. What was it about that scene that really resonated to you and that you were excited by? What's the story behind it? I mean, it's it's it, it's a it's a combination of like there's so many so many scenes there, but the, the, there was one thing that we we're all excited about the, the the fact that it's so different than everything else, and uh, it, there there are a few things that like I remember Damian Mercano, uh, uh, our director for for those episodes and uh, for three and four, and, like we're talking about, like there's nothing else. Like it's the driving to the desert and the Ocotillo Lodge. They're like they have to to have such a specific look and different than everything everything else. And I think the the location helped so much, and just the idea that everything happens by the pool and just the blue saturation of that water. We're talking about how to get that right and. I remember, like, w the discussion with Justin was, like, go full on Helmut Newton. Just go around the pool and shoot as much 8 mil as possible. There were so many elements that were exciting and uh, they were unique within uh, And we should note that story. that is in Palm Springs, what we're talking about, it because that's where the Lakers have their um, training camp. So that it, it's all kind of happening at a real – I'm assuming you were filming at the real hotel. If not, it was an incredible replica. It's a real hotel, but in LA, it's it's the the Sheraton Universal that we we converted into. So that it has a very similar look. If you look one way, if you look the other way, it's like totally wrong. But with the help of uh, uh, VFX and and careful framing, I, I think we got it pretty close to the real to the real thing. Definitely did. I mean, I just looking at pictures of that of that place, it, it seemed as real as it could possibly be. I wouldn't be surprised if you went there. But there is something interesting about that scene because they are isolated in this oasis in the middle of the desert. And you were saying it looks different than anything else on the show. So what was what is it about being in that location, being in that moment at this point in the story that is so important? I think it's just like uh, for them was like like the way things are starting uh, and and everybody's figuring out uh, the the new way that it's that it's presented by by uh, McKinney. You know, and it's like everything comes together there. They're like the way we um, 
we're we're talking about the the training camp, and so like slowly things are coming. Yeah, coming it's together. for the people that haven't seen the show. It's it's the first time where they start to gel as a team. It's the first time they're introduced to the new way of coaching that they're going to have, and it was interesting to me to see that they needed to be taken out of their element to really gel together as a team. And I think you guys did a, a really good job of supporting that with the camera motions and the lighting. And it, I mean, it's that's as far as I got in the series so far because that's all that there is at this point in time. But it seems like you're really leading towards something um, in the cinematography. And I cannot wait to see where it goes. The show is called Winning Time. It's on HBO. Um, by the time you hear this episode, maybe the whole series is out. Who knows? But- uh, it, it is absolutely fantastic. And like I said, I am not a basketball fan. I am a major fan of this show. It is not what you expect. Um, and you will certainly not be let down. It, it, it is a show for cinematographers for sure. So our our audience here at Go Creative Show, you will all love it. So thank you, Todd and Mihai, for coming on. You guys are really fun to talk to. And just the show is just fantastic. Congratulations. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Todd, Ben Hazel, and Mihai Malimari Jr., cinematographers for Winning Time. Uh, I mean it, you guys. Check this show out. It is awesome. I love, love the way it looks. And, you know, great acting, great story. I mean, it, it's just, it's a show for me, that's for sure. It is my style. So if you've ever wondered what kind of a style I have, I think this is it. I really, really love this show. So check it out and let us know what you think of the show and also this conversation. Uh, you can find us at gocreativeshow.com. Uh, as well as your favorite podcast apps. Uh, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, all of it, we're all there. You can check us out uh, to see this episode and many, many others. I want to thank Filmmakers Academy for sponsoring this show. Master your craft at gocreativeshow.com forward slash Filmmakers Academy. And don't forget, you get 10% off with the promo code GOCREATIVE10. I want to thank Connor Crosby, our producer, for pulling this whole thing together. You can find him at ignitionvisuals.com well as Dave Siegel for mixing and mastering and making the show sound so good. You can find him at SiegelSound.com. And if you want to follow me and what I'm doing with my production company, uh, BC Media Productions, you can find me at Ben Consoli on Instagram and Twitter, at Ben Consoli, B-E-N-C-O-N-S-O-L-I. Thank you guys for joining us today, and we will see you next week on another episode of the Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers.